Friends, colleagues, esteemed guests, welcome to the third in our bicentenary series of the 2022 Gifford Lectures. My name is Joanne Anderson and I am the head of the Department of Art History. I am also a member of the Gifford Lectures Committee. The Gifford Lectures are named after the prominent Scottish advocate and judge Lord Adam Gifford, who died in 1887. In his will, he provided for a series of lectures to be held at each of the four ancient universities, Aberdeen, Edinburgh, Glasgow and St Andrews. With a view to, quote, promoting, advancing, teaching and diffusing the study of natural theology in the widest sense of that term. Since 1888, the Gifford Lectures have become one of the most renowned public intellectual events in the humanities anywhere in the world. Here in Aberdeen, Gifford Lectures have been delivered by luminaries as varied as Alfred North Whitehead, Etienne Gibbs Gilson, Karl Barth, Hannah Arendt, Richard Swinburne, Mona Siddiqui and N.T. Wright, amongst others. Our programme of 2022 lectures commemorates the bicentenary of the birth of Lord Gifford and to continue our series this evening, we are honoured and delighted to add a further distinguished name to our rosters of Aberdeen Gifford lecturers. Our speaker this evening is Lisa Sedaris, Professor of Environmental Studies with an affiliation in Religious Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Her research focuses on the ethical significance of natural processes and environmental values as they are captured or obscured by narratives and perspectives from religion and the sciences. She is author of Environmental Ethics, Ecological Theology and Natural Selection from 2003 and Consecrating Science, Wonder, Knowledge and the Natural World 2017. She has also written extensively on the environmental pioneer, Rachel Carson. Professor Sedaris, we are thrilled that in your very busy schedule, you have made time to come to Aberdeen in order to be here for this event. I now invite you to the podium to deliver your Gifford lecture entitled Unnatural Theology in the Anthropocene. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you all for coming out. And uh, it's a great honor to be here. It's, this is an invitation that was extended uh, pre-pandemic. And so here we are two years later um, uh, for a bicentenary that was originally in 2020, I believe. So I'm just very glad that we could all actually be here in person. I didn't know if this would eventually happen, but here we are. So it's lovely to be in person with human beings and having a conversation that's not on Zoom. So um, the topic of my talk tonight is unnatural theology in the Anthropocene. I think another way of thinking of this is uh, forms of myth-making, the way that the Anthropocene presents itself as a, a kind of myth um, that draws on religious myths that may be familiar to you. Uh, in the interim between the time that the pandemic began and now, it's possible that my my view of things has taken on a slightly darker cast. I don't know. So, um, so I also just want to say thank you to Paul and to Paula and everyone behind the scenes to arrange these lectures um, and uh, probably lots of other people that I don't know about. So again, it's a great honor. Thank you. So a problem that has long preoccupied me is how to decenter the human so as to make room for values in the natural world. I'm not a theologian, I'm an interdisciplinary humanities scholar, and yet it seems to me that in order to get to something like such a decentering of the human, if we can ever get to it, we have to pass through something like theological anthropology. Let me move this a tiny bit. Whether explicitly theological or not, pronouncements about the kind of creature that we humans supposedly are are also necessarily judgments about the value of nature and non-human life. These pronouncements include numerous proposals issued by scientists and public communicators of science. While non-scientists like myself may not generate the data, 
that inform these pronouncements, humanists are positioned to scrutinize the links between the natural and human sciences and the normative conclusions about who we are and how we should live. And one of the things that I do in my work in particular is pay attention to the way that scientists and uh, public communicators of science speak in terms that sound religious, even if they are not sort of themselves uh, religious in terms of their, their background and their commitments. Humanist scholars generally, and perhaps religion scholars in particular, are positioned to illuminate the ambiguous and multiple meanings to be derived from these sciences, and to keep in mind that whenever scholars speak in broad strokes about the human, we court a dangerous process of exclusion, of defining some particular vision of the human against other ways of being in the world, both human and non-human. So with that caveat in mind, I think we can at least say this much. Our status as an evolved creature creatures who grew out of an evolving nature and came to be preoccupied with their relationship to that very shifting, dynamic thing that gave rise to them. This status provides a starting point for thinking about the human. In itself, our evolved status does not provide an answer. It is rather an opening on many questions. So being human is a question, perhaps a theological question. It is, uh, so sorry, it's being how, a question of entails asking, for example, how we ought to relate to the world and whether we are capable of relating to it in ways that we think we ought to, given the limits inherent in that very status of being a finite, evolved creature among myriad other evolving creatures. So to make this a little less vague, Humans are often understood in both theological and scientific circles as having a kind of dual nature, that is, something like both creatures and beings who create. So we are both created and creating. And I think this account has some merit. Something like it seems to be embedded in many evolutionary narratives, as well as religious stories. about the human, most obviously the idea that imaging God means participating in or mirroring divine creative capacities. In fact, at times it is difficult to even distinguish the two genres, that is, what we call science and what we call theology, as scientists and science writers often diagnose the human in ways that wittingly or not resemble religion in form and function. Human capacities to create, to make and remake worlds, are often invoked and even lauded in these pronouncements, and I'll give you several examples of those this evening. This is particularly true in the so-called Anthropocene, which is the topic of my lecture tonight. Imperatives to redesign, restore, and engineer the natural world often express religious-like aspirations. To note their resemblance to religion is not to say whether these aspirations are good or bad, but my lecture this evening will call attention to certain trends in Anthropocene myth-making that I believe we ought to resist. Humans' hybrid status as creatures and flawed creators presents us with a puzzle, I believe. Like the state of puzzlement that is wonder, and wonder is a theme of much of my work, like the state of puzzlement that is wonder, the question of the human is not a question in a straightforward sense. It does not admit of final and authoritative answers. The sciences don't solve this puzzle, although the sciences may shift the pieces around, creating novel configurations, new patterns, and new inquiries. These inquiries often have a distinctly ethical flavor. How and when should we use our knowledge and our creative powers? Where do we locate ourselves in the broader spectrum of creaturely existence? So science, like religion, has an interrogative quality. But science, as science, cannot determine how and when the knowledge and the tools that it produces ought to be used. For science enthusiasts who presume otherwise, that is, those for whom the creation of a new tool becomes reason enough to deploy it, wonder often takes a kind of auto-idolatrous form. By that, I mean a kind of self-worshipping or self-reverential form. Wonder becomes then an excuse to avoid difficult questions, a temptation to indulge creative powers without sufficient regard 
for context or consequences. The word idolatry may sound quaint to modern ears, but I think it captures a kind of inversion of values, the corruption of creaturely sensibilities with aspirations of omnicompetence. It signals a misdirection of wonder, wonder at ourselves and what we take ourselves to be. Theological anthropology then, including in its secular guises, ought instead, I think, to engage us in an open-ended inquiry into whether, how, and when to fit ourselves into the world around us. I have always cast my lot with thinkers who speak to the limits and the fallibility of humans, including the ethical necessity of voluntarily limiting ourselves at times. The farmer, poet, and essayist Wendell Berry for example, defends a mode of being he calls propriety, a sense of fittingness that recognizes humans as part of a larger, irreducible whole. Propriety represents, presents us with a set of overarching questions about who we are in response to an exteriority that is something beyond the self with which we are called to relate. In response to that exteriority, um, there have been a number of approaches that I'm calling sort of unnatural theology of the Anthropocene in the sense that they sort of turn that exteriority back into something that is merely an extension of the self. So these claims may not sound novel to you, as I've already suggested they might sound quaint, but I think they bear repeating in light of a portrait of humans embedded in what I'm calling this unnatural theology of the Anthropocene. Emerging technologies and grand evolutionary narratives present us with an opportunity to consider what it might mean to resist the seductive storyline of humans' creative control of nature. These narratives of the Anthropocene exhibit certain recurring motifs, and I will present you with some of these. While on the surface they promote an ecological agenda, an understanding of humans as part of nature and imperatives to restore nature, they simultaneously portray the human in ways that at best actually set us apart from nature and at worst bolster extravagant claims of human exceptionalism. Central to these endeavors is an image of Homo sapiens as a creative, world-making creature whose ascendant evolution both mirrors and advances a larger cosmic drama. So that's sort of my preamble, and then I'll start by looking at some of the basic contours of um, an official narrative or a dominant narrative of the Anthropocene. So as many of you probably know, the Anthropocene names the bold but increasingly accepted proposal that humans have so radically changed the planet as to propel it into a new geological epoch altogether. Named after the dominant species, Anthropos, humans, that is currently reshaping the planet, the Anthropocene carries either honorific or damning connotations, depending on your perspective. Either way, visions of the Anthropocene are never merely descriptive. They actively engage their narrators and audiences in myth-making and even a kind of prophecy. So a good deal of recent commentary on the Anthropocene has focused often critically, but sometimes exultantly, on a scaled-up human figure an aggregate human species, it's always the species, that is purported to have world-shaping powers. We evolved to become a geological force, according to this story. Our standout quality in this narrative is our unique capacity to recognize our world-altering powers. Earth has now evolved to reflect on itself as humans alone inaugurate our planet's collective awakening. So a common Anthropocene fable, then, goes something like this. We, the human species, unconsciously destroyed nature to the point of hijacking the Earth system into a new geological epoch. In the late 20th century, a handful of Earth system scientists finally opened our eyes. So now we know, now we are aware of the global consequences of human action. Another quote from Gaia scientist James Lovelock suffices as a kind of shorthand. He says, quote, by changing the environment, we have unknowingly declared war on Gaia. So pay attention to this unknowingly, because it's key to this story. So in this story, we may be forgiven for the sins that we've unknowingly committed, so long as we convert to the Anthropocene gospel 
and seek salvation through the newly acquired knowledge. Earth, in short, is now in human hands. So Exhibit A brings me to the work of one of the most prominent public-facing astrobiologists, astrobiology being the, um, you know, the, the search for life in the universe, the sort of understanding of the origin and distribution of life in the universe. Earth in human hands, already you get a sense of the image that humans are now in control of the planet. So in this book, astrobiologist David Grinspoon, who I had um, the pleasure of meeting in a seminar that I, I spent uh, a few years ago looking at the sort of societal implications of astrobiology. In his book, Earth and Human Hands, uh, Grinspoon undertakes an examination of the Anthropocene from a deep space and deep time perspective. How might we understand our present moment in light of contemporary knowledge about other planets and life in the universe? Of course, we only know of one planet that definitely has life in the universe. Do other planets go through similar evolutionary stages as Earth, for example? How do they acquire and lose the ability to support life? Taking the long view, Grinspoon presents the Anthropocene as an event that's propelling humans into a state of mature self-knowledge. Many species have the power to change and even recreate their environments. Think of things like earthworms or beavers. But there's only one species, the human, that has world-changing powers and is also conscious of it, according to this narrative. We alone have become a geological force that is aware of our own world-making powers. So Grinspoon interprets the Anthropocene in aspirational terms. Our present moment, with all of its dire warnings and potential for chaos, constitutes what he calls the proto-Anthropocene. The true or mature Anthropocene beckons auspiciously from the horizon. Its achievement is largely an intellectual, not a moral quest. We are not selfish or destructive creatures in Grinspoon's diagnosis. We are merely confused. He invokes a biblical idiom of lost innocence and knowledge acquired through adversity. The drama is scaled up to a planetary register. He says, quote, we've tasted the fruit of science and technology, and now our best chance for survival lies in cultivating planetary knowledge and a planetary identity in awakening to our part in this world. This transition will not require altruism or idealism, or self-sacrifice. Oops, let me go back. Altruism, idealism, or self-sacrifice, only accurate self-perception and enlightened self-interest, really an instinct for self-preservation. Central to this analysis is the idea of the human as a creative, innovative entity, with innovation being our sort of salvific force. Whenever and wherever in our evolutionary history humans have landed in a tight spot, we have saved ourselves by applying our smarts. So Grinspoon believes that the mature Anthropocene begins when we realize it has begun. Until recently, that is, human transformation of the planet occurred on an unconscious way, but a shift has now occurred. He writes, quote, self-conscious global change is a completely new phenomenon. It puts us humans in a category, all our own. The Anthropocene begins when we start to realize that it has begun. This definition, he goes on to say, also provides a new angle on the long, vexing question of what differentiates our species from other life. Perhaps more than anything else, he says, it is the self-aware, world-changing of humans that marks us as something new on the planet. The human is a being that um, can change the world and come to see what we're doing. So note how this narrative unw unwittingly um, dovetails with the dominant Anthropocene narrative that I outlined at the beginning. It is a naturalizing narrative. Our loss of childlike innocence is actually, on this view, a gain. It inaugurates a kind of fortunate fall. Our collective past mistakes were youthful indiscretions, a necessary and even predictable prelude to progress and enlightenment. So the next stop is planetary wisdom. Humans will embrace space technology for wise stewardship, he argues. Stewardship of this planet, but from above, a kind of uh, space stewardship. 
Earth and Human Hands also explores the attraction that Grinspoon feels for a cadre of thinkers known as the Russian cosmos, whose early 20th century secularized theology retained elements of Eastern Orthodoxy, including ideas about deification or theosis, sort of humans becoming godlike. Grinspoon embraces the cosmos vision of a future in which human destiny and survival lie in spaceflight and the location of other worlds on which to perpetuate our species. The Russian father of rocketry, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, is singled out for praise for his widely cited creed, which you may have heard. Quote, the earth is the cradle of mankind, but one does not stay in a cradle forever. Species maturity, the dawning of the real Anthropocene, entails breaking the bonds with Earth and establishing ourselves godlike as cosmic dwellers, sort of cosmopolitan in the most literal sense. Interestingly, Grinspoon is not alone. Another public-facing astrobiologist has sort of joined uh, in this philosophy, Adam Frank, who has a series of blogs, op-eds, public radio segments, and most recently his book, By the Light of the, uh, By the, Light of the Stars. Frank ventures that any intelligent species on any planet in the universe will inevitably, given enough time, force its planet's energy out of whack. In other words, it will create a global environmental climate crisis. Earth, he maintains, is currently transitioning through a generic set of stages characteristic of any planet with life in the universe. So when viewed by the light of the stars, the Anthropocene appears as a, quote, predictable planetary transition, or as Frank speculates, Anthropocenes may be common. They may be all over the universe. So like Grinspoon, Frank posits this process of one of maturation and awakening. He, too, emphasizes our lack of culpability for climate change and other Anthropocenic developments. Humans are not villainous or greedy, but merely an expression of the planet. Climate change is simply something that planets do. It's a sort of subsuming human agency under things that planets do. So climate change is then akin to humanity's final exam, symbolic of our having nearly completed the educational process that will deliver our species to full maturity. The Anthropocene then signals our quote, coming of age as a true planetary species. Indeed, in an online piece provocatively titled Climate Change is Not Our Fault, Frank ventures that, quote, the story we usually tell ourselves about the world that we built from fossil fuels and the climate change it has created is that humans are evil and greedy. But there is another way to tell that story. Here it is. We didn't change the climate because we were greedy. We did it by mistake using the gifts that evolution bequeathed to us. Human beings have been building civilizations, he says, out of whatever we could get our hands on for at least 8,000 years. It's just kind of how we roll. Climate change is here naturalized as an impersonal, apolitical, generic evolutionary process, a planetary scale phenomenon that Frank positively glosses in terms like innovation and opportunity. Innovation, he says, is the key word here. Evolution has always been about innovation of the endless exploration of new niches. End quote. So on this account, humans have always transformed the planet just by doing what we do to succeed. And in fact, our sheer ubiquity and longevity prove our adaptive success. So there's a particular definition here of success that tightly couples it with evolutionary success. So on to exhibit two, then. As Frank's reference here to niches suggests, there is a similar discourse emerging among some scientists and science popularizers that locates humanity's essence and our ability to alter our surroundings. We see this in certain treatments of what's called niche construction. According to niche construction, humans do not simply adapt to environmental circumstances. We actively modify our surroundings to suit our own needs. These modified environments, in turn, select for creatures like us, creatures with the capacity to make those modifications in a kind of iterative fashion. Niche construction is often promoted, as you may know, in tandem with with a call for a whole new evolutionary paradigm. It's called the Extended Evolutionary Synthesis, EES. 
EES, I won't go into it in great detail, but EES takes a less, a less gene-centered view of evolution, according greater weight to inheritance occurring not just through the gene, but also through forces outside of the gene, so epigenetics. And with its broader understanding of heredity, the new synthesis sees organisms as playing an active role in shaping their environments. This understanding of the role of organisms in modifying their environments looks at first glance like evidence of a kind of profound continuity among all life, a testament to the porousness of the boundaries between humans and non-humans and between creatures and their environments. Niche construction seems to put our species more fully into nature, placing our niche constructing powers alongside those of nest building birds or dam building beavers or perhaps elevating those animals to our level. And for some scholars, it does. But in other framings of the theory, and again, particularly when rendered for uh, a public readership, a wider audience, niche construction defaults to claims of human exceptionalism and discontinuity. Humans, we are told, are niche constructors in a class by ourselves, engineers of an entire planet, isn't that what the Anthropocene is, after all? These exceptionalist claims locate human uniqueness in our creative capacity and powers of innovation. As anthropologist Augustine Fuentes explains in the opening arguments of his book, The Creative Spark, so note that accent on creativity, singularly, uh, humans are singularly distinguished and shaped by creativity. Niche construction offers a new story of evolution of our past and current nature, a grand narrative to inspire and guide us into the future. The path of human evolution, he argues, capitalized on this creative spark, cultivating it to new levels and constructing an entirely new way of making a living on this planet that would eventually be everything else ever. While it's true that birds and beavers significantly alter their environments, the argument goes, humans re recreate their worlds in self-conscious ways. There's that note again. In keeping with our exceptional status. To be sure, this narrative of evolution highlights other features, compassion, cooperation, belief, imagination. And yet our species' successful history of adaptation is singled out for applause, irrespective of its long-term negative impacts on the broader spectrum of life, and in ways that extrapolate from the evolutionary past to a continuing, continuing pattern of success into the future. So there's a kind of narrowing or flattening here of success to mean essentially evolutionary survival. We're here, so we must be successful. Climate change in the Anthropocene appears collateral damage, unwitting blunders, unintended consequences of a world-altering creature doing what it does best. Our species' unparalleled power to create and to innovate has made us the principal force in the ecosystem. In a similar vein, Kevin Leyland, a biologist and leading proponent of the extended evolutionary synthesis, stresses the adaptiveness of human niche construction despite warning signs that our world making may actually be a form of world destroying. He writes, quote, in spite of excessive extensive change, both to ourselves and our environments, we humans nevertheless remain extremely well adapted uh, to our surroundings. This is in Darwin's Unfinished Symphony. He goes on, we construct our world to suit ourselves, leaving our behavior largely adaptive in spite of the radical transformations brought about in the environment. Our species' evolutionary innovations and accomplishments are, quote, unprecedented and unrivaled. Similarities between humans and animals are merely superficial, Leland argues, and the intellectual credentials of other animals have been inflated. By rapidly responding to self-imposed problems through cultural niche construction, humans maintain their adaptiveness. So we create problems, and then we create sort of innovative responses to them, and that's how we survive. So we can see how evolutionary success in these narratives is correlated with our entrance into the Anthropocene, a kind of promotion to planetary scale significance. The storyline of our erstwhile unconscious impacts on nature sets up 
what French philosopher Frédéric Nérat critiques as firefighter technologies. Nérat cites geoengineering as a firefighter technology, but de-extinction, which is my next example, fits the bill as well. Never preemptive, firefighter approaches only come after the fact, too late. And extrapolating from the past to the future, they assume that humans can always innovate solutions to the problems that we create. The narrative thus paves the way for, technologi for technologies designed to prevent societies from transforming themselves in meaningful ways. Environmental catastrophe is not a sign of culpable overreach, but an opportunity for ingenuity, a trial to be met and won with technology. It's our coming of age. So this brings us finally to de-extinction, a prime example of a firefighter technology and the third exhibit of Anthropocene mythmaking. So parenthetically, an interesting hallmark of firefighter technologies is that they also tend to reinterpret it's not just that they come after the fact, but they reinterpret what counts as life. So just keep that thought in mind. De-extinction is often referred to as resurrection biology for its purported ability to bring species that are extinct back from the dead. It's one tool within a suite of strategies premised on humans' creative world-making powers. Favorite candidates for de-extinction include the once ubiquitous passenger pigeon, charismatic Pleistocene megafauna, such as woolly mammoths, as well as more recently vanished species like the Tasmanian tiger, or uh, also known as the thylacine, and the humble but fascinating gastric brooding frog, who, as you can see here, whose ability to give birth through its mouth inspires visions of miraculous medical breakthroughs for humans. It is quite a feat. Currently, the most viable path to de-extinction involves technologies that aim to edit the genome within cells of living, that is, extant species, to more closely resemble those of a related extinct species. Once the genome is edited, it can be subject to somatic cell nuclear transfer. A zygote is then formed, which is gestated and birthed by the extant surrogate, um, or sometimes they hope in a, in a kind of artificial womb yet to be constructed. For example, using the DNA of an Asian elephant, scientists could repair parts of a degraded mammoth DNA by merging it with genetic material from an elephant. So it's important to note that the creature produced by this technique would be, would be at best a proxy, a hybrid creature, um, not a genuine replica, but something entirely new, a, a mammophant <laughs> or a elomoth, but in any case, a curiosity. A novelty, the novelty of the end product, the impulse towards creation, I believe, has much to do with the excitement that surrounds the extinction. Harvard geneticist George Church envisions artificial wombs. Humans presumably do the actual raising of the organism once it successfully emerges from a high-tech gestational contraption. So just picture a mammoth-sized artificial womb designed to facilitate a flawless elephantine gestation period of two years, producing an approximately 200-pound baby. You begin to get an idea of the time, effort, and expense and hubris that often defines these endeavors. The time, effort, and expense seem wildly out of proportion to what de-extinction at best might deliver. And while it's often hard to articulate the qualities that make a species valuable or its loss lamentable, Whatever those values are, they are relational. Species are dynamic, relational entities. They are not static, but living repositories with evolutionary histories shaped by complex entanglements with other creatures and natural environments. This is something that niche construction understands. A species is part and parcel of its environment. A de-extincted creature, or even a collection of them, does not restore the lost evolutionary and ecological values. And I can say more about why that is, but that is something that I believe to be true. Even if de-extinctions meet with technical success, these projects remain ad hoc, opportunistic attacks on a systemic problem that is utterly unaddressed by the technology itself. The problem is a problem with us. The remedy lies with, with transforming ourselves then, or something in ourselves, 
It is not a knowledge problem. Perhaps then, as I've already hinted, the true spirit of de-extinction lies with creation, not restoration, conservation, recovery, or resurrection. If so, what does it create? And for whom or what does it create? To be sure, these techniques may generate additional scientific knowledge and applications, and in fact, they are already doing so. And yet the stubbornly human-centered nature of such applications suggests an erasure of nature's exteriority, something that has value beyond the human. It's a refusal of what Wendell Berry calls propriety. So talk of creating brings us back to the theme of wonder. Uh, that's uh, a theme that is explored in a great deal in a, lot of, um, in a lot of my work, if you're interested, but I'll say more about it here, mostly on the negative side of what wonder ought not to look like. For it's within discussions of values created by de-extinction that wonder of a rather dubious sort often makes a showing. References to wonder and awe entailed in de-extinction frequently align wonder with economic or scientific benefits or the sheer excitement of transgressing technological and moral limits. Wondrous perks include the possibility that, quote, some revived species may be translated into useful products, such as pharmaceuticals. The gastric brooding frog might bring breakthroughs in uh, treating gastric reflux, for example, or other kinds of reproductive technologies. In a widely cited essay on de-extinction pros and cons, two bioethicists explain what is truly wondrous about de-extinction. Here it is. The last benefit, they say, might be called wonder, or more colloquially, coolness. This may be the biggest attraction of de-extinction, because it would surely be very cool to see a woolly mammoth. And while this is rarely viewed as a substantial benefit, much of what we do as individuals, even many aspects of science, we do because it's cool. It's heady stuff. Some scholars cite values associated with the wonder of seeing a living representative of an extinct species in a zoo or a park, not in the wild. They predict that people will pay large sums, as indeed they probably will, to own individuals who provide species. Here, arguments for wonder of de-extinction simply shade into disaster capitalism, presenting the extinction crisis as an opportunity for resource extraction, hoarding, and benefit, and profit. Ecological and ethical justifications feel tacked on as an afterthought to shore up the suspect claims for the urgent need to deploy this technology. There's also a kind of strange religion in disguise here, perhaps not so cleverly disguised, because the religion resembling lexicon of Anthropocene discourse presents a kind of strange mashup of motifs of resurrection, salvation, redemption, sin, temptation, all tossed together in a kind of prophetic future-oriented narrative that ultimately advances a religion of limitless innovation. These narratives often track, albeit loosely, a Christian storyline of the seductive appeal of creative power and irresistible knowledge. As one scientist puts it, de-extinction is just too sexy to resist. It's common to see de-extinction technologies framed as some version of the Frankenstein myth, a story whose elements pull from long-standing myths of Prometheus, Icarus, um, and, of course, the biblical fall itself. Needless to say, needless to say the media uh, loves that angle. But allusions to Frankenstein may be more accurate than even de-extinctionists care to admit. Frankenstein, after all, is not a story of resurrection, per se, but the creation of a wholly new entity from assembled lifeless parts. So remember this idea that firefighter technologies redefine life along the way. In a triumphal book-length treatment of the promises of synthetic biology called Regenesis, George Church praises the unprecedented power and allure of redesigning life on an unlimited canvas we are already remaking ourselves in our world, he confidently writes, retracing the steps of the original synthesis, redesigning, recoding, reinventing nature itself in the process. Indeed, nature itself has ordained for us precisely this role, Church suggests. We seem to be designed by nature to be good designers. Here we have the sort of secular statement of the dual nature of humans 
as creatures and creators. Our innate propensity to engineer on a grand scale is what distinguishes us from other animals. A peculiar euphoria often attends these technological feats. Witness how recent forays into space by elite billionaires and celebrities generate public excitement and rapt media attention. Even while the objectives of these hugely expensive and energy-intensive endeavors remain completely obscure, why are we doing this? Indeed, like the extinction, these space ventures invoke a time-worn, time-worn environmental trope that looks somewhat flimsy and even laughable. Much as species revivalists speak of saving life and repairing the Earth, private space companies headed by billionaires promote space travel as an antidote to ecological collapse and moral despair. The more people see the Earth from, from above, Virgin Galactic's president insists, the more change you can make here on Earth. But the excitement that attends these missions is not excitement about making change on Earth. It is rather enthusiasm for novel achievements, something to actually distract us from the dire earthly realities. Wonder, in other words, functions as a convenient shorthand for optimistic exhilaration. However impressive these feats, genuine change, the kind of change that could halt Earth's unraveling, is actually our much greater challenge. So an interesting feature of these narratives is the assumption that humans can acquire the needed wisdom, that once we become sufficiently collectively self-aware and mature, we can turn our world-making powers toward good, becoming wise managers of the planet. Humans' track record of adapting environments to ourselves is assumed to bode well for our future ability to do so. But how will this wisdom come about exactly? The narrative assumes rather than explains humanity's pivot toward the wise and the good. Humans alone reconstruct their worlds knowingly, the story tells us, and this knowingness will somehow point the way. Somehow we will transition from blundering through inadvertent global changes to thoughtfully and deliberately controlling our impacts on the planet. The mythic language of burgeoning consciousness, lost innocence, acquisition of benign intentional management enables a kind of peculiar escape from accountability, even as it celebrates Earth's completion, the fulfillment of Darwin's unfinished symphony at the hands of one supremely creative species. The narratives both frame and limit our conceptions of human agency and our visions of the future. Allusions to planetary wisdom suggest that our arrival at the current moment, a moment defined by mass extinctions, soaring CO2 levels, ubiquitous plastic waste, and other mounting atrocities, that this moment marks the transition to a higher evolutionary stage. And yet our arrival at this stage is somehow built into the narrative from its inception. Faith in our own endless innovation and creativity obviates the need for genuine reckoning and change. Instead, we are told that the way forward lies in doing what we have always done, but wisely. And yet for all its mythic resonance, the narrative is stripped of vital reference, reference points and reminders that religions can actually provide. So as I begin to conclude, I want to return to the theme of wonder, um, piecing together some insights from thinkers who uh, I think have correctly grasped our situation. So this is wonder not as a form of auto-idolatry and distraction, but wonder as a kind of proto-moral response to the condition of being creatures who exist within contexts of relationality. As I see it, the conditions of creatureliness, this is a fact of human existence. Whether or not one subscribes to a religious interpretation of that fact, we are moral being, mortal beings who share numerous behaviors, preferences, and evolutionary ties with other organisms. We exist within certain parameters over which we have limited control. Creatureliness acknowledges our shared embodied nature with other beings, our common vulnerability and biological fate. To posit creatureliness as a natural fact is not to dismiss or denigrate the idea that you know, humans are also the product of a creator. Whether or not one is committed to that belief, there are insights, I think, to be gained from theological reflection. 
not least because Anthropocene discourse so often mimics, <laughs> albeit in a confused way, the plot, devices, and discursive turns of the religious myths we have inherited. These Anthropocene stories, in other words, have clear theological antecedents. So then back to wonder. Properly understood, wonder is a questing and questioning mode, as I've said. It engages us in a process of discernment that has no terminus in a dynamic and changing world. Inquiries into the kind of creature that we are and ought to be often provoke anxiety, because when the human really is framed as a question, it becomes clear how much harm previous answers to this question have caused. These harms are apparent in the many ways in which the category of the human as I suggested at the outset, functions to exclude certain others from moral consideration, both within our own species and beyond it. Uneasiness in the face of this inquiry tempts us to banish the ambiguity and to seek certainty. The desire for closure, I believe, accelerates the rush toward te technologies like de-extinction, pursued as if extinction were a tractable technical glitch rather than a problem in ourselves. On the topic of the human, theologians and scientists alike, although the latter might not realize it or admit it, often gravitate towards a sort of idiom of imaging God. As I've suggested throughout, the godlike dimension that humans are often assumed to mirror is the capacity to create or innovate, to bring worlds into being. But this move to define human creativity as exceptional innovation ignores a generative puzzle the perennial puzzle of what exactly it is about the human that might show us to be in the divine image. Wonder as an opening into the unknown might help to hold these questions open, to dwell in mystery and to gauge in discernment. At the same time, however, what it means to be human is not a completely wide open question. There are parameters. Certainly, um, our encounter with climate change is an encounter with a very real limit. Well, the future is not wide open, but nor is it foreordained. So how might we begin to recognize some of these parameters? What we know with certainty, I think, is that we are creatures who exist among other numerous living entities. A moral imagination grounded in creatureliness puts emphasis on what bioethicist Bruce Jennings calls, quote, dynamic finitude and constrained becoming a capacity developed within and through relationships of accommodation with the limits and the gifts of evolved nature. The human imagination cannot function on an unlimited canvas. A limitless imagination is not a moral imagination, but at best an amoral one and quite possibly an immoral one. Framed as a condition of being constrained, creatureliness sounds a lot like perhaps condemnation or confinement. The talk of restraint and limits sounds very negative. As environmental writer and activist Bill McKibben notes, it's like being told to eat your bran when there is ice cream on offer. Who wants that? But it's worth considering that creaturely status frees humans from trying to be God, whether godlikeness is understood explicitly in religious terms or as a secular kind of placeholder for aspirations towards omnipotence transcendence or control. Turning again to the fall narrative, Rowan Williams observes that Adam's resentment at not being God is what empowers Satan to seduce him into overstepping his creaturely boundaries. The same resentment fuels a widespread denial of death, aversion to aging, and a longing for the security of technological control. Williams confession, confesses, quote, when I read in discussions of our environmental crisis that we can be confident our technology will find a way, my blood runs cold because I hear in that the refusal of real creatureliness, end quote. If creatureliness is our condition, then grappling with issues like extinction and climate change does require a kind of inward turn of sorts not the internalized wonder of auto-idolatry, but a recognition that something in us must change in accordance with the destructive changes that we have wrought. Otherwise, our tools are merely an extension of our self-regard. The decentering power of wonder, wonder defined against self-regarding instrumentalizing impulses, might help to recover 
what Rowan Williams calls the lost art of being a creature. Perhaps then the primary task that we face as humans in an era of climate change and mass extinction is to honor our creaturely nature um, in tension with capacities for creativity and innovation, to honor otherness alongside continuity with other creatures. Our supreme challenge, as Rachel Carson understood over half a century ago, is, quote, to demonstrate our mastery not over nature, but of ourselves. There's no formula for this balancing act, no final dissolution of the tension, but wonder might counter the default anthropocentrism, enlightened or otherwise, that characterizes so much Anthropocene myth-making. It might help to short-circuit the habitual tendency to grasp at techno-solutions to existential questions. The desire for hope and optimism is understandable, of course, in these dark times in which we are living. But we might start to look beyond competing narratives of either techno-salvation, on the one hand, and inevitable decline and catastrophe, on the other. Each story, in its own way, conveys, conveys an excess of certainty. The certainty of optimism versus that of despair, a certainty that is not available to us as creatures. Capacities for hope and moral agency, then, distinct from techno-optimism, locate themselves within the premise that the future, while constrained, is not already written. The past can provide a sense of hope, as writer and activist Rebecca Solnit argues, not because it presages what the future will look like, not because the past tells us what the future will look like, but because it reminds us that history is full of surprises. Solnit says this, quote, we pretend that life, like art, has plots, and that we know how the story ends, whether it's an election or a cultural shift or the outcome of any major event. She continues, and we often err not on the side of caution, but on the side of conventionality. The future, we believe, will look like the present. Interestingly, then, what she's saying is that optimism is invested in the status quo, not in change. The dominant Anthropocene storylines that I've been looking at here tonight exude an unimaginative conventionality. Regarding, sorry, rejecting the closure of these narratives, then our task becomes one of an uncertain but hopeful project of discerning how our agency aligns with other complex values with which we are embedded. Where the creator controls and perfects, the creature searches for an ethical mode of accommodation of fitting into a world replete with wonders it did not create and cannot fully understand. This is Wendell Berry's mode of propriety, or fittingness. So, propriety presents us with a set of questions in keeping with wonders, questing spirit. Where are we? Who are we? What is our condition? To raise questions of propriety is to recognize, as I've said, an exteriority, to which we are called to relate, rather than subsuming it within our ever-expanding technosphere. It might mean resisting the temptation to remake the world in our image. It might mean letting the dead be dead and grieving accordingly so that we might change. Against the voices of celebrants of our boundless human creativity, others point us back to conditions of creaturely finitude. For humans as creatures, Wendell Berry argues, limitlessness is hell. He invokes the famous scene from Marlowe's Faust in which Mephistopheles instructs Dr. Faustus on the very essence of hell. Hell hath no limits, nor is circumscribed. In one self place, but where we, that is the damned, are, is hell. And where hell is, must we ever be. To be unlimited is the purview of God's alone, that is uh, Wendell Berry's point. By normalizing a culture of limitless innovation, we believe that all of our ills can be cured through doubling down on acts of world-making. He says we are now, in short, coming under pressure to understand ourselves as limited creatures in a limited world. Creatures, then, are beings who necessarily live, act, and create in context. The alternative for us for planet Earth, and for all living things, is hell. Thank you. Thank you very much.
very much, um, Professor Lisa Zderis, for your wonderful lecture. I think there's just so much inspiring material and a very thought-provoking material for us. Uh, yes, on the final note there um, of depression. But um, um, we now open the floor. We have time for some questions to respond to this very thought-provoking lecture. And I'd invite anyone to raise their hands if they would like to ask a question. And um, you'll notice that there is a button on your console that says speak. And I will ask you to invite you to switch it on when I ask you to ask your question. And that means that we can hear you in the audience. So the floor is open for questions. The questioner asks whether considering all of humanity as we and us adequately reflects the variation of global cultural perspectives. Uh, thank you for that question. I think that that is really the question. <laughs> um, and it's, it's kind of where my own reflection on and, and critique of, you know, this use of the we and of the human, where I have sort of ended up trying to think of what sort of what is left that we can say about the human, um, and I, or why even speak in these terms anymore. Um, I mean, my own sense is that there, as I think I said in the paper, I think there are certain things that are undeniably a function of being human. That is, that we have, you know, minimally, we have this sort of finite condition that we're born into, finite but dynamic, um, that we find ourselves in relation to other creatures, that uh, part of realizing what it means to be human is to take those things into account. But I think that the, the motif of creation or co-creation uh, has often been understood as a kind of co-creation between humans and God. Uh, I would think that it's actually with other life forms that are non-human as well. I think that the only, the only way that we will be able to recover from the moment that we're in, in terms of the planetary crisis, is through the, um, you know, the rest, restorative work that's done by other organisms. Um, and so the we, I think, as creators, if we want to retain that language, should include those organisms as well. Um, and so the, the escalation of the human, the elevation of the human as, as something that's distinct, I think is, is something that, that's, that's keeping us from recognizing that kind of continuity. It's very hard to talk without using we, and it's something that I've become very conscious of um, and tried to sort of give a little bit at the beginning to say, you know, sort of nevertheless I'm going to use these terms. Um, to talk about the human, but but you're right. I mean, I don't I don't yet have the right answer to that question. It's something I continue to think about. Professor Sedaris is asked to say more about the theological language used in restoration narratives. She is also asked to what extent she uses wonder in a theological sense. Thank you. Yeah, the the first part of the first question. Um, I think what I'm trying to say here is that. The, the, what interests me is the way that religious language is being used in a deceptive way, I think. I think it's, it's presenting itself as something that's engaged in uh, the restoration of values or something that's sort of um, other-oriented or reclaiming some value that's been lost, when I think the, uh, the real excitement about it is, is actually about creation, which is much more... Um, it's much more of a spectacle. You know, the, the sort of work of restoration and conservation is not nearly as glamorous as bringing something back from the dead. So I think it's actually a deceptive use, and I think that there are legitimate uses, <laughs> including theological uh, uses of that kind of language of restoration. Uh, I have thought about wonder, I think, in, an, in a sort of I guess in, in a lang I, I speak of it in language that I hope that theologians can also see it as a theological response. I mean, it's certainly, uh, I consider it an ethical response, uh, something I didn't get into that much in this paper, but it's, a lot of this is in my book, is the way in which wonder, it is a decentering thing. It's, a, it's, it's an experience that, uh, that makes one open and vulnerable and therefore more inclined to uh, empathy, compassion, um, a recognition of otherness. So 
I think that all of those things have theological resonances as well. I, I prefer to kind of, at least in my most recent work, to keep it open to either kind of interpretation. But in its history, certainly, in the history of wonder, um, there are strong theological currents that shaped what we call wonder today. Professor Sedaris is asked if she considers rewilding projects, posited by the questioner as the opposite of extinction, to be anthropocentric, both theologically in a human act of repentance and also as humans attempting to geoengineer the planet. Yeah, I mean, it's um, the, the question of rewilding is one that's come up a few times since I've been here, actually, in conversations I've had with people. And that term means, it means very different things to different people. Um, I think that I think that for some, rewilding is close to uh, something like geoengineering perspective in the sense of, um, you know, just sort of letting letting ecosystems evolve with whichever, whatever components are there, you know, whether they're non-native introduced, you know, um, as long as there's a certain amount of, uh, you know, diversity within the ecosystem. It doesn't matter that it is, uh, you know, native, that it has, you know, that it represents the sort of historic um, portrait of what that ecosystem looked like. But I think there are other, so there are other ways of thinking of rewilding that are more within, I think, traditional conservation. And I think, you know, even going back to things like, uh, you know, Aldo Leopold's work or people who, who promoted, you know, reintroduction of wolves and things like that. Um, so I think it runs, it probably runs the gamut from something that's more ecocentric or, you know, other oriented to something that's more human centric. Um, so I think if it's a kind of rewilding that's done without regard to the, um, the history of a place and what makes places unique and the species that historically have made up certain ecosystems, then I suspect that it's probably something closer to a kind of geoengineering. Professor Sedaris is asked how current solutions proposed to the environmental crisis reflect her notion of limitlessness. An example offered is the net energy consumption of the planet. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think the, the de-extinction or just extinction issue itself is a very good one because, um, I mean, not only... You know, I mean, de-extinction does have, I think, a lot of the earmarks of a kind of techno fix. But, you know, when you when you look at the reasons that that certain cultures have, uh, well, I mean, the, the main reason that species have gone extinct is habitat loss, primarily, but also because humans simply didn't want them there. Right? Um, there's a, you know, certain organisms create inconvenience for humans having certain types of organisms in places where people have domestic animals, you know, whether it's pets or, you know, sheep or whatever, um, much like, again, reintroduction of wolves, people are very upset because they don't want those things to harm their animals. I think it's that sort of thing, the kind of work that has to be done with communities to understand, um, you know, the reasons that people have driven these organisms to extinction in the first place. And that means, I think, accommodating ourselves in some ways, giving up some of our own conveniences, uh, our, own, our own profit, our own, um, our own concerns, and, you know, to, to actually, if we want those things back, we have to live with the kinds of inconveniences that it means to live alongside other organisms. So, uh, so that's the kind of thing that I have in mind. But also just, you can imagine anything like where I live in California, uh, it's, you know, everyone drives everywhere. You know, there's no place, there are a few places left for animals to be able to even, you know, migrate without being hit by a car. You know, these are just, these are not major sacrifices, but people are unwilling to make them. Um, I think because of the idea of freedom, you know, the idea that you should be able to drive anywhere that you want all the time. Um, you know, so that kind of thing, just recognizing that these other organisms will live there too, you know, and that we, we can't simply just adapt the world to ourselves. We have to think of ways that we actually fit into that um, and that those things have a right to be there as well. So, um, you know, I think a lot of people who do this kind of multi-species ethnography work where they, you know, actually work with people on the ground to discover 
whether it's possible to, to reintroduce species. This is not the kind of thing that's being done in most cases before, you know, technologists are thinking about de-extinction. They're just thinking about it as, as a kind of a neat trick to bring something back. Should they ever actually succeed in doing that, that would not even begin to address the problem of why species go extinct in the first place. So, yeah. So um, as we bring the proceedings to a conclusion, I just want to raise um, um, three things. The first is to draw your attention to the further Gifford lectures taking place this month. Um, the next lecture will be on Tuesday the 15th of November next week at um, 6 p.m. here in this um, conference centre, and this will be given by Professor Tim Whitmarsh of the University of Cambridge. Um, Next, I would like to invite you to join me to um, thank Professor Sedaris um, for her talk and to join us um, at the drinks reception out in the James McBay um, Hall, um, which um, is just um, in the rooms behind you. So if you just follow the crowds, that will be um, where you will find your refreshments. So um, please join me in thanking um, and showing our appreciation again to Professor Sedaris for her lecture and her graciousness in conversation. Thank you.